And we're live in three, two. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Planet Mullins podcast. We're at season two already. And uh, thank you all for your support for season one, all the emails and uh, donations. Well, no donations yet, but hopefully sometime soon. <laughs> and all the watch time and the beautiful things that have happened. I mean, um, I don't want to get into too long of an intro because I would be ignoring my auspiciously accomplished guest here today who's got his fingers in every aspect of uh, entertainment and entrepreneurial ship, if I may say it that way. Please welcome to the podcast, Mr. Christian Eastwood Bell Navis. Hey, hey, what's up, Big Rob? And, and to TV land and TV world or across the globe. All right, man. Hey, uh, it's so good to see you. And I, um, you know, I'm a little bit biased on this particular podcast because in the last few months, you and I have become such hilarious friends. Oh, you yeah. know, we, we, <laughs> for I'm everybody. That, and hearty. Well, <laughs> Abbott and, and Crustello. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> uh, but, but you know what's so cool about it is that the way that we met, if you don't mind me telling the story, was through an ad. Oh adverse situation where uh there was another producer in la who was um a mutual friend of yours and mine but we hadn't met yet and then you had artists you were managing at the time named jade and we'll talk more about jade later in the show but you got stuck right at the last minute without a keyboard player for her hollywood debut yeah. and so you ended up getting my phone number it was just a few days before the gig you called me up and I didn't know you at that time, bro, but you did sound a little panicky, and I would have been panicky and pissed off. <laughs> the double P. I was the double P. <laughs> so I said, yeah, man, I could do it. I was open on, on that night, and you and Jade came over to my office. And uh, right at the beginning, man, she and I had a cool vibe. Like, musically, everything was beautiful. And with you, it was very easy, too. So we did the show in Hollywood. Uh, for Jade, it came off great. And then afterwards, you and I ended up just, you know, exchanging uh, some conversation to decide, well, as they say, <laughs> we just decided we were going to hang out because we both liked each other. Yeah. And, and then a lot of time went by in there and we suffered through the virus and all these other things. But what was so interesting about it for me was that as I got to know you, I had no idea of your history and your accomplishments and all of the different things that you do. So let's start right away with the acting, if that's okay. Yeah, whatever, it's your, it's your thing. I'm just a squirrel in your world trying to get it done. <laughs> squirrel in your world. <laughs> well, you know, I, um, yeah, obviously anybody uh, out there would, you know, if they see you in one of your shows like uh, Empire or Blackish or Brooklyn uh, 911, uh, coming coming right up on this Thursday or you on Fox or in a commercial, they're going to understand that you're a handsome guy, you know, and you dress up and you're uh, very well suited to the acting business. And oh, well, tell us, well, tell us how you got. So, this. yeah, you know, I'm like, like, like you have explained, you know, I'm an actor, entrepreneur. I got my hands in a little bit of everything. You know, I keep I keep the irons hot and keep the coal on the fire. Right. Uh, been acting for about 36 years. You know, wow. I had a couple of series, one on MTV, uh, MTV Undressed, one on NBC called Hang Time back in the day. And, uh, you know, just been rocking and rolling. As you as you had mentioned, you know, August 12th, they're bringing back season eight of uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine on NBC at eight o'clock. And uh, I got a little bit part on that. that that's uh, in, that's uh, NBC or ABC? NBC. 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 Okay. Oh, yeah. We were uh, able to... Uh, you know, get that shot during the pandemic uh, back in December. Uh, and they finally, you know, they kind of switched around when they were going to release it. And they finally came out with the fall schedule. So it made it. And uh, and here we go, you know. And so, you know, prior to that, I did uh, American Housewives, Speechless. I had a reoccurring on All Rise, How to Get Away with Murder, SWAT, uh, you know, Blackish. Why? You know, just a you know a, a long laundry list of blessings. Right, wait, wait, wait. You're on SWAT. Oh yeah, I was. Uh, oh, uh, you're, you're, you're gonna admit that on international TV? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For, 
and I'm looking to get back on there again. Yeah. Well, right. yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, no, it's been a roller coaster ride of greatness, you know, from four years old to 41 years later, you know, just still getting it in. And uh, it's a blessing, and I thank God for it. Well, you know, the um, the thing about it that with the star struck struckness or that factor, the star factor is that, and you, I know you've experienced it. I experienced it too because I'll be somewhere like out on your boat and just kicking it and uh, looking pretty bashed up from the night before. And somebody will come by and say, you're Rob Mullins? Oh, my God. I bet I got 25 of your albums, man. Would you sign my solo cup? You yeah, know? Well, you, you, you're, you're the most accomplished. You know what I mean? When you talk about 40 years, 40 albums, 81 to 2021 is still going. I mean, how can you not? You know, and then, you know, just going to Denver with you, I got to see, you know, the, 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 the kiddies flock to the candy man. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, for, for, people, for people that don't know, um, last week on July 30th, I released my 40th album on CD in Denver and, uh, Thank you. Thank you. You get to stand and up sitting down. Well, Christian, you made, uh, you know, you made quite an impression on everybody there in Denver, and I'm still getting feedback about what a classy and uh, handsome and cool vibe, you know, your whole thing is really cool. And, and uh, so, you know, but you've done, besides all this acting stuff, you did something that I, I just looked it up and I had to laugh, bro, because Every time, every time I see somebody's bio that I already know the person, but I don't know all their history, there's always something in the bio that I go, "What?" And <laughs> don't be interesting here, because <laughs> you know, it was a couple of years ago. Um, there was a big controversy about Empire and Jesse Smollett. Okay, okay. So, so and you probably remember that controversy, and people that don't know about it. Well, first off, there's a cool video of you producing him in the studio because you did the music for Empire for like a season or a series of episodes. And you're in the studio being all serious and doing your thing. And then I'm watching the YouTube and I look over and I'm like, it's Jesse Smollett, that guy that like paid two guys to come mug him or something. <laughs> <laughs> now... I don't know nothing about what you're talking about, but I will say <laughs> you know, there was a time a couple of years ago where we were doing a, a partner of mine and we were doing some music for Empire. And, uh, uh -huh. you know, it was a great opportunity that Fox, you know, delivered to a lot of uh, unknown and some known producers and, and, and arrangers and writers, you know, to come in and and to help, you know, their, their musical shows that they had going right. on. I was blessed to uh to be a part of, you know, that great session that you're speaking of and, uh, you know, deal with such a great artist as yourself and, and, and accomplish. Uh, guy. Well, I, I like how you dodged my question 100%. You didn't ask a question. You made a statement. I let you <laughs> be a statement. Okay, so, all right, well, here's I've been here for 36 <laughs> years now. You know, I got a little bit of wiggle in me, too. <laughs> I know. So here, here's my question is, was, well, you know, do you think that any of that, stuff that they put in the media about him hiring those two guys to like beat him up and tie him up with a noose. Was any of that true or was it not? Well, here's the thing. And and, and this is probably going to sound weird, but I don't watch the news. I'm probably okay. one of the only people that never watched the news. So realistically, a lot of the information I get mm -hmm. is either from people like you or somebody else who's watching it and they come tell me about it. And then, you know, the story is like pieced together. But to be honest with you, I don't care, man. I got too much stuff going on to worry about whether somebody's hiring somebody or right. you know, getting hung or, yeah, I, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm not, not empathetic to the situation. I just don't care. It has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not my lights stay on or the gas goes into my car. So, you right. know, Hey, everybody's got a plight. We've all, we all come fall short of the glory of God one way or another, you know what I mean? And so right. I'm sure I've, I've probably been in that same situation. Now, I may not have hired somebody. I do all my self-destructing, self-destructing myself. So, <laughs> it, it gets me you know, in the wrong I might put a hole in my own shit. You know? <laughs> Other than that, you know, God is good. You know, it's a blessing to work with who we work with, whether they get caught in a good light, bad light. You know, it's enough lawyers and enough PR people to, to, to watch people right on through it.
Yeah, I agree, man. I always tell people, too, if they're, you know, kind of gunning for me, trying to take me out or take me down a notch or whatever, I just look at them and say, man, I don't need your help making at all. Make me look bad. I could do it all on my own. I've been doing it all. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) That's that's what we do. (laughs) We can (laughs) self-destruct. Going going even further back in in your history, and I want to talk a little bit about um, you know, other things that you've done, accomplishments as a producer and a writer and a rapper. How did it uh, come about when you were younger that you and Snoop Dogg ended up in the studio together? Well, that was uh, that wasn't too young, too young of a go ago. That was uh, probably you know l- mid late two thousands. Uh, there was a guy um, Sloan. Uh, uh, he did uh, Bastards of the Party. Um, and he's an actor, accomplished guy in in the neighborhood. He was in uh, with Denzel Washington in uh, what was the one that he got the Oscar for? Um, uh, you know the movie with Denzel and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. He's one of the guys in in the gangs and whatnot. And uh, he put this DVD together, this documentary called Bastards of the Party. And uh, basically, this this DVD is is a a factual document of how gang banging has started out here on the West. Okay. And uh, I was in the studio with Battle Cat and uh, we were watching the DVD. And then in watching the DVD, Cat got inspired and he produced a record that myself, another brother named Box, uh, we we began to write to and we ended up recording that night. And then there was a one, you know, one phone call later. The next thing you know, Snoop Dogg is like, ah, I got to get on that. And he's on it. And uh, it just became a great record that, you know, we... Uh, produced and put out. And then I think Urban Pope, who was the musical uh, uh, executive with Bastards of the Party and that whole thing, Cat delivered it to him. He put the rest of the seasoning on it. And the next thing you know, my my boy from Chicago and another guy's got the hook sounding great. Cat's on the track. I got the first verse. Snoop's got the bringing up the rear. And wow. He's had this great last day's record that, that you know. I don't, I don't really know any other person on this planet in my world that say, I got the first verse and Snoop's bringing up the rear. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, if you, hey, well, if you understand a relay race, you know that that anchor has got to hold it down. It really don't matter what happened in the beginning, in the middle. That anchor is where it ties that knot. So, you know, for me, my favorite artist of all time is Snoop Dogg. So to have me be able to pass the baton to box and then right. pass the baton to dog, that's, you know, a dream come true. You know, well, I mean? no, man, that's got to be absolutely, yeah. absolutely 100%. So, you know, I, I used to love the the early stuff that was coming out of your neighborhood and in the nineties. And then I remember Nate Dogg and Warren G uh, one night after they'd been at a session, they were all high and they drove into Taco Bell and then they got, they got their order and then they didn't want to pay. So they just pulled out a gun and said, we're leaving. And they got arrested. (laughs) I don't know nothing about what you're talking about. There you go. again. I love it. (laughs) I saw that on the news, and I don't know who made that up, but... You got to stop watching the news. <laughs> <laughs> you got to turn on some Tom and Jerry or some yeah. Scooby-Doo. <laughs> I think I gonna just, I'm going to have to stick to uh, Gunsmoke and Dodgers games. Uh, hey, yeah, there you go. Yeah, try that. That's <laughs> no, no more try news for me. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the price is right. They might lead you in a good direction. Oh, Jeopardy and Price is Right. Yeah, man. Well, that's a whole nother conversation. But right now, what are, um, you know, I know you got this thing happening on Thursday on Brooklyn uh, Nine-Nine is coming out. Are you, um, is there a particular area of focus that you're into right now? Because I know yesterday as we were getting ready to do the show, you were talking about a well that's happening that you're involved with in Africa. Yeah, that's my- yeah, so I have a nonprofit called Hope Ministries. You know, okay. and we uh, we give back to the community. We uplift the uh, and enrich you know the lives of the youth, young adults, adults, anybody who's you know in need of, of some type of assistance. Right. Uh, it's based on changing the mind state of people. You know, if you can change a person's thought process and how they perceive and, and their perception of things, and you can actually make them a viable piece to society and to themselves and to their family and so on and so forth. And so with uh, this nonprofit, you know, we give 
give back to the homeless. We give to single mothers on Mother's Day, single fathers on Father's Day. We're always doing something throughout the year just as a give back. Uh, right. Next week coming up, we have a uh, backpack drive that we're doing, and we've chosen the Wooden Center over here in uh, L.A., right off of uh, Manchester and Western that we're going to donate, you know, most of our backpacks to them. They have a great program that they've, they've put down for uh, kids since back in the eighties. So we're going to help them, but yeah, man, most recent time I met up with a guy named uh, Greg, who is the uh, uh, president and, and, and he runs uh, St. Bryce missions and he's been building hostels and churches and water wells in Africa and Costa Rica and wow. all over the globe, man. And it has always been a dream for me since I was a kid to, you know, give back to, you know, Africa and just to help people, period, all over the globe, not just in Africa, but anywhere I could put my hand in. But the opportunity came, uh, you know, to, to work with the people of Mimboza in Zanzibar, Tanzania. And, uh, you know, I jumped at the opportunity. And so, yeah, we're building a well there. Uh, in Mimboza for the people of that village, you know, to, to have fresh water and now to, they can get clean, you know, and, you know, I mean, heck, we take showers and we brush our teeth and wash our face and we really don't understand the magnitude that that carries in other countries, and not just third world, but in, in you know, lower, lower partitions of, you know, the economic balance, man, it's just yeah, water man. Is an essential thing, you know what I mean? And uh, to well, be able to bring well, that to somebody is a beautiful thing. People who haven't traveled, I always encourage people if they're watching my show or in a mentoring program that I sponsor, I'm in the studio with them. I always encourage people to travel because, you know, you're right. What what we all get on the news is whatever it is. But, you know, I've been lucky enough to go to Africa. I did the uh, Luanda Jazz Festival over there with Hubert Laws. And man, I got to see some stuff over there that I, I thought was um, really appalling. You right, know, right, frankly, right. some of the conditions, because we were staying in a hotel that was like a Ritz-Carlton vibe, and there was, you know, two-pound lobsters everywhere and these giant right. steaks and this and that, and we got the president of the country uh, is a Hubert Laws fan, and we became friends. But you go five blocks from that hotel, and the people that are there are living in complete abject poverty oh, so yeah. oh yeah they got blight areas in the whole nine and they're and they're you know you look at their cows and their goats and they're just, they skinny as, as stick figures you know what i mean which lets you know right. that it's it's a need over there not just uh uh for for lip service but actual physical execution of right. delivering people something that can help them live and thrive you know what i mean and so yeah Man, we we busted out the water well. It's gonna take about five to six more months, but okay. they've already broke ground. They're already digging, and you know we've got photos and stuff back uh, as of the other day. And it's just a beautiful sight to see to be a part of something that is really worth something because that's the substance of the world. All the music and the TV shows and all of the other things that I'm into, it really means nothing in, to me in comparison to being able to help uh, some less fortunate person. Well, you know, that's your spirit and your giving kind of spirit along with your, um, you know, sense of humor and your talent. I think people will, uh, as you start to do making your mark more in all of these worlds, they're going to really start. Your fan base is going to really start to build because after knowing you just on the music side and then getting to know you better, I'm a much bigger fan than I was even a month ago. And I've watched a lot of these Hollywood celebrities going over to Africa with these video crews, and it's all about the celebrity, man. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, they might be helping a little bit, but it's all about them getting higher ratings for their TV show or more pub for their this and that. And you're not that kind of cat, which is very impressive because you don't care about all that. Well, thank you, brother. But, you know, yeah, you know, all of that stuff is, you know, everybody's got an agenda and everybody's got their own way that they have to handle their business. You know, a lot of times what people fail to realize is, is uh, you know, you have a sponsorship, like even you with your show, you know what I mean? You have certain people have sponsorships and they got to pay the bills. And it's unfortunate that most of the stuff that we see on TV is not really what is actually taking place, you know, and there's a uh -huh. lot of there's a lot of depictions that will make it seem like, oh, it's just a quick photo op, but 
That's just them paying the bills uh, you know, because somebody has funded the trip to bring them over to promote, you know, their water or their brand or their clothing or their socks or whatever the case may be. But there mm -hmm. is always a larger, bigger picture in the background that's taking place. But, you know, to your point, yeah, man, you know, whether somebody send me or whether God take me or whether I go myself. You know, it's it's never about the. It, it always, you know, you gotta always watch the person that's like, hey, look at me, I did this, I did this, I did this, because realistically, they're letting you know that's all they got in their bag. I'm more so the quiet guy that's not gonna tell you nothing. But if you read good, you'll see my name attached. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, let's sponsor reading programs all over the world so people. Oh yeah, can, we got to get read about what a bad badass you are. <laughs> hey, man, we're gonna put it on the back of the bazooka gum like they do. <laughs> <laughs> man that's uh, there's so many cultural references that you and i share and and you know a lot of people find that very unlikely i mean um here's a here's a silly story of something just happened yesterday and you were part of this too so all right here we go i got this, I got this upcoming gig right and it's a uh, it's a thing that i invited you and my crew to and i'm part of a new crew uh in l.a it's based on a smaller crew, but yeah. now it's getting bigger. And my smaller crew is me and Preston Glass, the producer, and his yeah. wife, Gina. Yeah. So the three of us have been doing stuff in studios, basically just colorblind since 1991. We don't think about any of that stuff that people are tripping on. And then you recently came into the picture. Now there's this great singer, Jade, that's part of all of our world that's in the picture. So. Anyway, I'm talking to the booking agent yesterday, right, about this thing coming up. And I'm saying, oh, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, I can make that gig. Oh, they have a piano? Great. Um, well, I got, I got uh, basically, my family is going to, like, come. You know, they want to come and uh, support the gig. What's, uh, you know, what's going on at the club and stuff? He says, well, it's, like, pretty busy. And, um, you know, but I, I got to, I kind of got to warn you. I said, uh, he says, uh you know, it's like more than 50% black. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I started laughing and I, I, I probably shouldn't have texted him back so quick, but I, I texted back and I said, I don't have any white friends, only you. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Rob Mullins. <laughs> hey, man. I mean, it's kind of an exaggeration, but it's just like. No, no, I got you. It's like, who cares, man? See, and that's like watching the news. You see what I'm saying? Like, right. I don't, I eat, like, who cares? I don't care if you blue, purple, or green. I need somebody to play the piano. Can, right. you play, can your dog play the piano? <laughs> get, get over in here. Let's get this <laughs> Well, the, the other thing that I noticed, I think there'll be inspiration to, um, you know, the people that watch my show, because my show is a lot about successful people in music and arts and the recording thing and how they became a success. I noticed that you're very goal oriented and self motivated. I mean, is that something you were always kind of a, what they call the go getter and the, you know, personality type or what? Yeah, I think it was it's, it's kind of bred in me, you know, I, I, I give all homage to those who paved the way before me, you know, my grandmother on my father's side, you know, she started a flower shop in 72, which I took over in 04. And, you know, so that birthed my whole flower shop ownership and business and out of that. And then uh -huh. my grandmother on my mother's side, you know, she owned a thrift shop and did all of that. So that birthed my retired young and Bell Neighbors, you know, clothing line and all of that. And uh, my father's on both on all sides, you know, they were just hardworking men. My my uncles, my grandfather, you know, he was the one doing yard sales. He taught me business. He taught me how to negotiate. He uh -huh. taught me how to get out of a person what you wanted, you know. And so um, through the years, it, it just became one of those things from a kid growing up that it was just instilled in me, you know, you got to do what you got to do to get it, you know, and, and there's a certain way you go about it and there's a class about it. And there's also mm -hmm. a, a grown aspect to it uh, right. and being an actor at, you know, four years old and actually, you know, going on the set and all of that, it helped too, because it grew me up because I had to deal with adults. And although I was a child, I was still put in a mature situation that I had to handle because people were relying on me to give them exactly what the script said, if not more, in order to make their picture and their genius come to life. 
And so right. that, that at times can be a lot on the kid, which is why you see a lot of self-destruction that happens later in life, because a lot of people are put in, in large magnitude situations, but they are not given the foundation that's needed to help mentally be able to carry them on through. And so they end up having nervous breakdowns. They end up, you know, overdosing. They end up doing a whole lot of things that they don't need to because that family unit wasn't there on all sides. Wow, man. Wow. That's so interesting because um in between where i'm living now and your neighborhood is culver city and there used to be a place called the good guys it was like an audio place and stuff and i would go there and get all my computer stuff and um uh, so there was that show different strokes with arnold was on different oh, yeah. strokes oh, yeah. man after long after his heyday had happened and stuff it got really sad because Arnold was one of those kid actors that had all the disputes with the parents over the money and his parents mostly were uh, from the outside looking at it looking in it was like they were not really uh, having his mental health as the priority and I would go into that good guys and when he would be in there about once a week on a big video game and he would be talking real loud to himself gotcha and it was an outcry of the guy really needing love or, you know, an intervention or something. Because he's just there in this aisle by himself, you know, playing this game and everything and being him. But it kind of frightened people a little bit. Like, I couldn't go over to the cat and say, hey, man, are you all right? Well, you know, one thing I, I've ran into, uh, oh, Gary, a lot, too, over in Westwood, because there was a big, big arcade. That used to be right on, uh, I want to say maybe Daly or LeCompte, one of those streets, but it was uh -huh. over there. And he was a big time gamer. One thing I know about games, because I used to play them too, you going to talk to yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, especially if you in it. I mean, if you catch some of those Madden tournaments, you you got people yelling at the screen and throw. I got kids that throw, uh, throw remotes at the screen and break the TV every other week. You know, in a lot of these families that I, I go and mentor to because, you know, they mad because they player, they, they hit that little button and the player, he went left when they wanted him to go right, interception, lose the game, and they going nuts. You got grown men who talk to themselves. <laughs> that was, this game. So, that's if right, you on, hey, if you meet me on the golf course, you're going to hear me talking to myself. <laughs> a shot or two. So, you know, gaming is, is, you know, on all levels, whether it's electronic or, you know, we're out there on the course, man, it's serious business. Yeah, you know, probably like it is with you when you at the piano. You know, if that finger don't go right, you get that little author. Author come meet you. You are gonna start talking to yourself. Too. <laughs> That's right. We're folks. We're talking about uh, Gary Coleman uh, from Different Strokes. My guest today is the fantastic Christian Eastwood Bell Navis. And Christian, uh -oh. we we still didn't get to how did you get your nickname Eastwood? Because when I first came back to L.A., I was playing across from UCLA in Westwood. Right. And I had never heard of Eastwood until you and I met. So you, can you tell that nickname story real quick? Well, you know, that, that came from my, my father. It gave me that name. It was uh, back in probably like 89, 87. And, you know, I was I had a great uh, um, acting career going. Okay. And fortunately for us, you know, in the hood, you can't call anybody Hollywood. Because although it means it, it sounds good, it do, it doesn't have a, a a positive connotation. A Hollywood person is basically a person who's who's overlooking you and treating you down. Uh -huh. and so he he liked Hollywood, but he was like, I can't call you that because that just don't work. Um, and then uh, you know Compton, we were on the east side of Compton, and so he said, you know what, I'm gonna call you Eastwood, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it just it kind of stuck, you know, and. Uh, I love him for it, you know, hey, you know, came from Pops, I had to use it, I had to take it, and then, you know, everybody started going with the whole Clint Eastwood thing, and so he would say, well, yeah, I do keep a 44, and, you know, I will make your day if you mess with my son. <laughs> <laughs> it just kept going from there, man. So, That's hilarious, man, because, yeah. you know, the, um, well, I mean, even on speaking of your Pops and stuff, one of the things that I thought was so cool that happened on, uh, Father's Day and also on his birthday, man, is that uh, you've got a boat now out in the marina and you, you know, sent limos for your dad and your uncle and you brought everybody out and like made them dinner and everything on the boat 
for for you know just a family vibe and I'm, I'm glad I don't got nobody looking for me because you just gave them everything about me that I might not have had wanted them to know you know if the IRS was looking for me for tax evasion they wouldn't know where the money was now going to Rob thanks your your class act no I just wanted to let everybody know that that boat in San Pedro is really close to Compton and you can just you know Meet us down there because we'll be yeah. down there later, so right you there. You can be robbed down there. I didn't sold it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Well, I never knew the good side of San Pedro Harbor till I met you, man. Come on now. Hey, it's real windy around there. You know, <laughs> getting a little cold at night too. Yeah, there's that. Well, um, so uh, before we wrap up, man, I um. I wanted to give you a chance to, you know, give any shout outs or any uh, anything else about what you got going on to talk about it. Well, man, you know, I just thank you, you know, for uh, having me on and allowing me to take up this airspace. You know, uh, a lot of great things coming forward. Not enough time to really throw it all out there. But, you know, I just say keep God first. Everybody keep, you know, pressing on. We're going to make it through whatever this thing is and whatever they want to call it or label it. And just uh, know that you're not alone. You are loved. And there's people out there who will give you a hug if you need one. You know, shout out to Texture. You know, we got a lot of great things coming together, as you know. You know, you are a part of that. And uh, you got a great album that just released this way up. So I'm looking forward to uh, helping you push that along and get that out to the radio and the masses and all that whole thing. We got uh, Jade, who is an international superstar on her way out. Terrell Edwards, who's, you know, getting ready to soulfully bring us back to the old school Teddy Prendergrass feel. You yeah. know, Glass is still surviving and thriving and kicking and you know, he's still making hits and BMI is still going, going, writing some old, check. <laughs> he's got some old things coming down the pipe. So, you know, it's just great. It's an honor. It's a privilege to be in a circle of uh, a, a bunch of geniuses. You know, I'm probably the, the dummy in the room, which is cool for me. I, you know, I'm, uh, I like swimming in a, a, an ocean where there's people that can actually eat me up. Cause then that, that causes me to learn how to uh, become a counter puncher and, uh, you know, find my uh, better skills to. Well, you know, <clears throat> there's um, there's so much that we have to look forward to now that by, you know, whatever the forces are, we've all been brought together. And uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure to know you and to, to work with you. So if people wanted to be able to reach you, uh, what's the best way for them to contact you? Call you. <laughs> they ain't got your number they can't reach you no they, if you want to help donate you know and do all of that you can go to hope ministries la.com okay. you know, for the non-profit if you want to read the books and everything that have been written you know you can go to mr soulfood.org um christian records llc at gmail.com if you got some music and you think it's texture worthy other than that man just catch me on the water somewhere at a stop sign or at a gas station and let's chop it up and let's see what the lord has us to do that's so great man well thanks again for for uh you know all of the great stuff that's coming to all of us and uh welcome aboard to this brand new adventure that we got going on and don't forget people the the reason that we're here, uh, you know, mostly is to talk about this coming Thursday, which is, what is that? Is that August 13th or 12th? August 12th, 12th Thursday, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Brooklyn Nine-Nine is coming back. You know, it's season eight. They're making it the final season. They're calling it the last ride, but I doubt it. I know somebody's going to pick this great show up and keep this show running. Andy Sandberg's doing a great job. And uh, you, you just got to watch it. Tune in, man. It's going to be quick, but it's going to be funny. All right, man. Thanks again, Christian. And uh, that's going to wrap it up for today's episode of the Planet Mullins podcast with Christian Eastwood, Bell Navis. Thank, Thank you, Rob. And we'll see you on the next one.